And now, time for everyone's favorite subject to discuss with coworkers and professional acquaintances, politics. And perhaps the most controversial presidential election process ever in U.S. history. Welcome, founding editor and publisher of the Rothenberg and Gonzalez Political Report, Stuart Rothenberg. Good morning. Those are angry birds, but they're not as angry as the voters. Uh, I'm a political analyst. I'm at the bottom of the food chain. I'm not here to tell you who's going to win, what you should think about issues. I don't really care. I probably will never see you again. <laughs> I am here to tell you what's going on in politics. I'm a political handicapper. So we try to talk about who's winning, who's losing, what you should look for, what doesn't matter, who is getting a lot of attention but has no chance of being nominated, the governor of Ohio, never mind, I didn't say that. Um, um, my specialty over the last 35 years has been U.S. House and Senate campaigns and elections, so we interview candidates, they come in for about 45 minutes or an hour, it's as if I work for UBS and I'm an industry analyst, but my industry is candidates for Congress or politicians. We start with date of birth, what your parents do for a living, so we get a sense on who they are, uh, who the candidate is, and his, up, his or her upbringing. We, we go through their education, their political experience, their business careers, if they've ever worked for a living. We talk about their fundraising, who they've hired for polling, what the voters want to hear about, what they talk about, and at the end of this 45 minutes or an hour, we get a sense on who they are and who they think, uh, or where they think the voters are. And I've been doing this for a long time. In some years, with some groups, we start with Alabama 1 and go to Wyoming at large, but we won't be doing that this morning because you all care about one thing, the presidential. So we'll spend 98% of the time on that, 2% of the time on is the Senate in play, and then I'll open it up for questions or comments if we have time. I like to do a lot of questions and comments, but we're running long, we'll see. All right. Now, I, I really want to emphasize I'm not trying to change, I, it doesn't matter to me what your positions are on trade, taxes, same-sex marriage, whether you like Donald Trump, whether you like Bernie Sanders, look, it's up to you. But I'm going to talk about their strengths and weaknesses and where they are and who's going to win and why and who might win, okay? So let's do the Democratic side since it's easy, the race is over, okay? Hillary's going to be the nominee. Now the numbers tell a little different story. It's not quite as clear and crisp. She needs about, after New York, she'll need about a third of the remaining delegates. Bernie will need two thirds of the remaining delegates. That's significant because the Democratic race, state after state, every state is proportional representation. It's, there's no winner take all. It, and, and the contests have, in many states have been very close. In fact, the, there have been a handful of blowout states that uh, uh, Sanders won big and, and Clinton won a bunch of states with large African-American populations, particularly in the South early by big numbers, but many of the states have been very close and there's been no difference on the number of delegates they each get. So the fact that, that Clinton needs, after New York, will need a third of the remaining delegates and Sanders will need two-thirds, it's a big deal. But let's look at the numbers. Or, Let's go to the videotape here. Uh, Hillary Clinton now has 1,791 delegates, 1791. Uh, Sanders has 1,115. She has an advantage of over 670 delegates. But her advantage is not really as big as that, is it? Because Democrats have what are known as superdelegates. No, these are not people in tight uh, uh, garbs and fly off of buildings although some Democrats have been known to do that. Um, these are about 700 Democratic office holders and formal, former office holders, whether it's members of Congress, members of the House, governors, members of the Democratic National Committee, and they get to attend the convention, and they get to cast votes for whoever they want. Uh, and then you have pledge or earned delegates that are won in these primaries and, and, uh, uh, and caucus states. And so if you break it down, Hillary's 676 delegate advantage among pledge delegates that were earned primary after primary, caucus after caucus, 
She has a, uh, Hillary has 1,304, Sanders has 1,075 for 229 delegate advantage. She has almost a 450 delegate advantage on these superdelegates. So her advantage looks huge, it is huge. Superdelegates are, they do exist, they do vote, they will determine who the next nominee is, but she has overwhelming strength among these superdelegates. Superdelegates, I didn't give you those numbers. Hillary, 487, 487 for Hillary. Sanders, 40. So that's, that's her advantage. Yeah, she's ahead by 230 among, uh, among uh, 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 earned delegates that she earned in primaries. But she's ahead by almost 450 with these superdelegates. And so Sanders is now making the argument if he, if he pulls up to even with her, close to even with her, on uh, earned delegates, it's unfair, it's undemocratic, it's unreasonable for these super duper delegates who are former office holders to tell the rest of the party what to do, to dictate to the party. That's not fair, it's not democratic, big D and small d. That's his, that's his only chance of changing this race. How much of a chance is it? Probably close to zero. I mean, it's not going to happen. But that doesn't mean Bernie isn't having an impact. He's pulled her to the left and he has kept the pressure on her and she's expected to win comfortably in New York today um, and has an advantage then uh, next week in the North Atlanta, Northeast uh, New England primaries that are remaining. So next week it's Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, Rhode Island and Connecticut. But after that, the contests move again to the Midwest and the West, and Sanders will probably do well. Hillary has built up this huge lead in states with large African-American populations. The white vote often splits about evenly. But in the minority community, Hillary has done great. And it's not surprising. She is married to the first black president, right? So it's, and she's built up a long relationship in the minority community, and that's her greatest strength, and Bernie can't cut into that. Now you look at 18 to 29 year olds, that cohort, this is a pretty young group. Usually I speak to people and they're like 90 year old white men. But this is a, looks like a more diverse group. Um, Hillary among 18 to 29 year olds, she's win, uh, Bernie's winning 18 to 29 year olds, sometimes 75%, 80% of the vote in state after state. Clinton on the other hand is doing very well with voters 65 and older. So, this is not Bernie Sanders' time. Maybe there's the beginning of a Sanders movement. Maybe we're moving to her as quickly as we can toward the socialism. I don't know. But for this election, Hillary is going to be the nominee. On the Republican side, it's a bit more complicated, isn't it? Now, if, if I, let's, let's do this. If I told you that a year ago, I was absolutely sure that Donald Trump was going to be the nominee, would you believe me? Uh, I hope not. No, of course not. The idea sounded ridiculous. Um, sure, we've had oddball candidates come out of the business community. Ross Perot, remember him? Um, you know, we have long shots every once in a while who have a, have a, a, a bump up in the polls. Do you remember Herman Cain? Who ran for the Republican nomination a, a few years ago, and he, he came out of nowhere. Um, and for two weeks he was leading the Republican race. So odd stuff happens. But Donald Trump, I mean, you know, Donald Trump is in a kind of a small universe of people, celebrities, Donald Trump, Kim Kardashian, uh, I don't know, people who are quirky, entertaining, but I, I would have thought nobody would take seriously. But Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, one of them is almost certain to be the Republican nominee for president. Here's the Republican race. Republicans need 1,237 delegates, real simple. One, two, three, seven. That's what they need. Trump right now is at 758, Cruz at 553. In third place is, who? John Kasich, no. No, he's, he, he's still behind the guy that dropped out of the race a month ago. Marco Rubio is in third place, and John Kasich is fourth. So Trump 758, Cruz 553, Rubio 173, and Kasich 145. So is it a three-person race? I usually describe the Republican race as a two-and-a-half-person race. Um, 
because the John Kasich is running the most bizarre race. It's hard to imagine. Probably some of you like John Kasich. There is some reason to find him appealing. He is a, he is a lone remaining uh, pragmatic Republican in the race. Ted Cruz is conservative, and Donald Trump's an entertainer. Uh, I don't know where he stands on any issues. It really, in Donald Trump, it's not about issues. It's about Donald Trump. Uh, but John Kasich is a, was a member of the House, chairman of the Budget Committee, uh, the two-term governor of Ohio. He's got a great bio. He's got a great resume. The only thing is he has no business still being in the race. John Kasich has now won one more state than I have. <laughs> and I'm not in a, either race, the Republican or Democratic race. John Kasich, out of, out of uh, I think there'll be 10, 10 contests to go after we go through next week's primary. So there are about 15 still now, 16. John Kasich has won one primary, his home state. Every other primary he has lost, and he still is behind a guy who got out of the race a month ago. So John Kasich is like the kid who refused to go to his room. When his parents are tired of him, he's knocked over the lamp and everything. Get to your room, John. No, I'm not. I'm going to stay in this race. And so it's, it's really kind of strange for, to kind of describe his situation. But he, simply put, he figures this. He looks at Trump, and who he sees as a loose cannon who doesn't reflect traditional Republican values and isn't supported by the Republican establishment. He looks at Ted Cruz as somebody who is too conservative, particularly on cultural issues, but also refuses to compromise, has a reputation of being arrogant and obnoxious, and is totally disliked on Capitol Hill, even among his own party. And he figures, what the hell? I'll just hang around. At some point, somebody is going to come to their senses. They'll realize that I'm the person who can beat Hillary Clinton. And on all the ballot tests, Kasich does beat Clinton. And Trump loses to Clinton badly. And Cruz is, is competitive, usually losing by two or three points. Um, that may be his high watermark. But Kasich does best. And Kasich figures what I have to lose. I can't, I've lost 35 races so far. So what if I lose another five or six? I'm still in the race, and when we get to Cleveland uh, and nobody, and nobody uh, gets enough delegates on the first couple of rounds, they'll turn to me. Well, I, I doubt it. I mean, the guy keeps losing. This is an incredible strategy. I'll keep losing and losing and losing until they turn to me and they nominate me. <laughs> right? Look, anything's possible. Donald Trump is in the race and he's leading <laughs> delegates, so anything is possible. But the, the Kasich strategy is a long shot. How about somebody else? How about Paul Ryan? There's been a lot of talk about Paul Ryan, or I remember the speaker. A lot of people in the Republican establishment say, oh, yeah, yeah, you will get killed with Trump, and, and uh, we can't stand Cruz, so we'll have a couple deadlocks. The first ballot, Trump will fall short, and Trump absolutely, positively must win on the first ballot. If he doesn't, hundreds of pledged delegates, pledged to him, are then unpledged, turned loose, their commitment after the first ballot uh, goes away, and many of them will not vote for Trump on the second or third or subsequent ballots. He's got to win on the first ballot. He may. We talked about that in a second, but he's got to win there. So, so the establishment says, well, well, Trump doesn't win, then Cruz, and he can't win, so then we'll offer up Paul Ryan. Now, you may have noticed that Paul Ryan, two or three days ago, came out with a statement saying that he would not run or accept the nomination. Did any of you see that? It was on the news. He said, absolutely, positively not. I will not be the nominee. I will not run. I will not be the president. No way, nothing, no how. Which to those of us in journal journalism means he just kept the door ajar, cracked a little bit <laughs> as to whether he may run. Um, probably, I, I would say you could probably wipe his name off, except, again, Donald Trump is the front runner in the Republican race, so anything's possible. So will Trump get 1,237 delegates? I've talked to a lot of strategists who say the odds are he's either going to get as many as uh, 1,300 or 13 and a quarter, or as few as 1,050. And that's the range. And the key state to look at, he's probably going to do very well in New York. Um, he may sweep all of New York's 95 delegates. 
There's a statewide, you get, there's an allocation statewide. If you get 50% of the votes statewide, you get all the statewide delegates, but also then there are delegates per congressional district. Um, he may sweep all of them, and then he'll supposedly do well in, in the Northeast and New England next week, but then we move back to Indiana and Nebraska and West Virginia and a number of states where he'll do less well. The contest will not be decided, will absolutely positively not be decided until June 7th, that's the last set of primaries, California, New Jersey, New Mexico, South Dakota, and Montana. June 7th will decide it. Um, I think most people in Washington, most people in my business think that Trump will fall a bit short. Again, what's a bit? Is it 25 or 50? In which case there are unpledged delegates. There are a handful of unpledged delegates on the Republican side. North Dakota, Pennsylvania is going to elect some unpledged delegates. I think Guam's is unpledged. Um, maybe American Samoa, North Dakota's unpledged. So there are some unpledged and, and if Trump is within 25, 50, 75, he'll probably get those. And if he's within 100 and a quarter, he may have to go to John Kasich and offer him the VP and see whether Kasich takes it. But uh, if, he is, if Trump is, is a couple hundred votes short, it's going to be very difficult for him to get uh, uh, the nomination. Watch the first ballot. If he fails on the first ballot, watch Cruz for the next two ballots at least. Cruz will then go to Kasich and offer Kasich the veep. We'll see whether he can get enough. And after three or four ballots, then, the, then everything is up for grabs. We have no idea what's going to happen at that point. So uh, keep an eye on the race. The general election, Hillary Clinton, well, I'll give you this. I'll just I'll read you the uh, unfavorable numbers. Do you have a... So I went to, um, where did I get this from? Real Clear Politics. You either go to realclearpolitics.com or pollster.com, which is Huffington Post. So I got these from Real Clear. Do you have a um, favorable or unfavorable view of Donald Trump? I'll just read, you can see this is like 30 polls here. I got them all here, favorable, unfavorable. I'll just read you the number that say unfavorable. 69, 60, 70, 62, 60, 63, 62, 65, 65, 68. You get the drift? Two out of three Americans have an unfavorable view of Donald Trump. Ted Cruz, do you have a favorable, unfavorable view of Ted Cruz? Again, just the, just the unfavorables. 55, 59, 51, 57, 57, 52, 58, 52. About 55% of Americans have an unfavorable view of Ted Cruz. And now the third candidate who could possibly be elected. Hillary Clinton, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of Hillary Clinton? Again, I'm just reading the negatives. It's a U YouGov economist poll, AP, uh, Fox, Bloomberg, CBS New York Times, CNN. Here's Hillary's unfavorable. 56, 55, 57, 54, 54, 55, 55, 49, 57, 58, about 55. So the, the three people most likely to be nominated for President of the United States by both parties have negatives of at least the mid-50s, and in Trump's case, it's the mid-60s. In fact, none of these people could possibly beat anyone other than the other two of the people in this group. <laughs> It is amazing, <laughs> stunning. And somehow, this is the bunch. And, and we weeded out a socialist Jewish uh, senator from Vermont who looks a little bit like that Dr. Emmett guy from Back to the Future. <laughs> Dr. Emmett, what was his name? Emmett Brown, you know, I mean, let's face it, you may like Bernie Sanders, but he kind of looks like the crazy uncle who, who crashed his nephew's bar mitzvah and is going to embarrass the family. I mean, be honest. So, so, so Hillary Clinton would...
would be the favorite in the will be the favorite in the general election, not because she's so popular, not because she's so liked. Those of you who are Democrats in the audience probably do like her and agree with her on issues. And even if you're a Sanders person, you may be annoyed at her with all the corporate, the, the Goldman Sachs stuff and the speeches that she gives. Believe me, I'm all for people giving speeches. Uh, but, but on issues, most Democrats uh, agree with Hillary and they think uh, they are comfortable with her. They're not comfortable with some of the corporate Democratic stuff, obviously, but, uh, but she'll get most of their votes. Uh, so Hillary's the, Hillary would be a favorite over, over Trump and over Cruz, more narrowly over Cruz. She has huge negatives. Independent voters do not like Hillary. If you're an independent voter who likes Hillary, fine, that doesn't make you wrong. It just makes you different than most independent voters, and that's fine, we, don't, we allow that in this country. But most independent voters don't like Hillary. They don't trust her, they don't believe she's forthright, they, they think she, she uh, you know, it's like her husband. It depends what the meaning of, of is is, you know? And they, that's the way they feel about Hillary. And, and you've got the emails and the Benghazis and all that stuff. But uh, she doesn't have the huge negativity that the other candidates do. Uh, Donald Trump has this whole scenario about how he can win by winning Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. And, you know, traditionally four states have mattered. Four. So if you live in Maine, Vermont, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Kansas, Kentucky, Tennessee, Oregon, Washington, California, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota. If you live in any of those places, you're probably nice people, you're just ir irrelevant in the presidential race. <laughs> so the presidential, most presidential contests come down to four key states. And they're Ohio, Florida, Colorado, and Virginia. Those were Obama's four closest states in 2012. There was only one close Romney state. That was North Carolina that he won by 2.2%. Every other state was much bigger than that. And so the Republicans need to hold all the Romney states and win the four swing states that I mentioned. And if they lose any of those four swing states, Ohio, Florida, Virginia, Colorado, then they've got to go to the next group of most competitive states in, which includes New Hampshire, Iowa, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Nevada, and they have to win enough electoral votes to offset the ones that they didn't. So it's a tougher haul for the Republicans. Donald Trump says, oh, but I can win a whole bunch of downscale, working class, white, older men, and that is his sweet spot. Trump gets voters from all voting groups. He gets suburban, he gets upscale, he gets downscale. Sure, he gets, he gets a bite from every group, but his sweet spot is older, angry white men. Lord knows there are a lot of us. No, uh, there, are, <laughs> there are a lot of them. Uh, I'm not real angry, I hope you can tell. Uh, but there are a lot of angry people. And he is bringing people who've never voted. They're 65-year-old men who've never voted because they think the system is so corrupt, so broken, they've never had somebody they could trust. Apparently, they don't care that he's crude and rude and, 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 uh, and that his language is unpresidential. They don't care about that. They just care about how angry he is. Uh, the problem with that argument, there is truth to that, that he can bring in new people. The problem is he'll lose a whole chunk of other people. I just posted a piece in my, on Roll Call that I write for, a newspaper. Yes, they're, they're all dying. Uh, owned by The Economist. I don't know whether English, British magazines are dying, but they seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, where I look at defectors and the history of defections from Republican voters, from Republican presidential candidates in the past, going back to 1980, believe me, Trump will have significantly larger numbers of defections than did Mitt Romney and John McCain and going back into the 80s. So the bottom line is Hillary will have, a, will have a significant advantage over Trump, a smaller advantage over Cruz, the campaign will matter, uh, and we will have many, many, many more months of meanness, uh, partisanship, uh, and um, uh, uh, Fox and MSNBC trying to give you information that will uh, activate you, energize you, and or convince you. And that's, that's the culture we live in now, so deal with it. 
Uh, I'm going to take one minute on the fight for the Senate because the Senate does matter, then open it up to questions, comments, however long they give me. They'll probably give me one or two, I hope, maybe more. Uh, the Senate matters. Well, here's how you know the Senate matters. One of the reasons Trump has done so well is that there are people in this country, God forbid in this room, but probably in this room, there are people in this country who believe that in 2014 when the Republicans won the Senate and when they campaigned and they said, look, elect us, we'll check Barack Obama, we will, we'll roll back Obamacare, we'll, we'll stop him on global climate change, on all his agenda, elect us, and we'll be there, we'll fight him and we'll stop him and we'll dismantle what he's done. And there are people who believe that. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't want to change what Obama's done. Hey, you decide for yourself. You don't like Obamacare, you don't like his position on global climate change, you don't like his position on immigration, you don't like his position on same-sex marriage. That's your business, that's not mine. But I know how the system works. And if you thought, or if these people in the country thought that suddenly he was going to change everything, by electing a Republican Senate. They're going to roll back Obamacare and roll back his global climate uh, uh, agenda. You needed a civics lesson, because that's not the way the country works. Um, the Senate turns out to be really important, and the House is important, but the White House is important. All three have to be run, really, controlled by one party. The Senate is 54 Republicans, 46 Democrats. The Democrats need four more Senate seats to get to 50-50. If they win the White House, then their vice president breaks the tie, assuming Hillary wins the presidency and picks somebody other than John Kasich to be our running mate. Um, five seats to have an absolute majority. And right now, all the action is in Republican-held Senate seats. In Illinois, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in New Hampshire, in Ohio, in Florida. Why is, why is all the action in Republican held seats? Because this, the class of 2016, was elected six years ago in 2010. Do you remember that election? That was the Barack Obama first midterm election where if you had an R behind your name and a pulse, you had a decent chance of winning. People were so unhappy with $787 billion stimulus package, cash for clunkers and the like, and they voted Republican up and down the ticket. Now these people are up in a presidential year where you'll have higher Democratic turnover, by that I mean more younger voters and more Hispanics, and they're going to be in trouble up and down the ballot. And so the Democrats are actually poised, they're in pretty good shape to take over the Senate. What does it mean for Washington? Probably still more gridlock, because Republicans are likely to maintain control of the House. It's not a done deal, but it's pretty close, just the way the districts are drawn. drawn. So if you're unhappy with the partisanship and the bickering, you're going to have to get used to it. That's the condition we're in right now. The country is divided. You just have to figure out a way to survive, both personally and in terms of your businesses, in that environment. I'd be happy to take a couple questions or comments if I'm allowed to. OK? Yes. So um, yes, there's a gentleman in the balcony. I always wanted to say that. No, ge gentleman in the back. Can I come down from here, or why screw up the sound? Huh? Mr. Rothenberg, yeah. is there, uh, if, if, some, if Hillary Clinton were indicted, which is probably unlikely, or if she maybe didn't get all of the 2,300 money she, she needs, is there any chance that the convention might nominate Joe Biden? So uh, is there any chance, some chance? Yeah, there's always, sure, there's some chance. There, there was an echo there. There was some chance that she could be indicted. I think it's microscopic. Look, I'm a, I was trained as a political scientist, so I can only kind of, um, you know, I've tried to learn what happens in politics, and when you get a black swan event, when you get something out of the blue that's so different from anything else, it's hard to know the impact. So if it would happen um, uh, before the Democratic Convention, the, so the Republican Convention is the third week, second, third week in July, and the Democratic Convention is the following week. They're about a month earlier now than they were four years ago or have been. Uh, it would screw everything up. Uh, I presume Democrats would not turn to Bernie Sanders. They would, as my friend Charlie Cook, look for the nearest, uh, uh, you know, in case of emergency, you know, smash this window. And inside, he, Charlie always says, is Joe Biden's telephone number. And they would call him immediately. I think 
Yes, yeah, so, so if something were to happen to Hillary, I, I think the party would, would try to turn to somebody who they felt secure with, confident, someone who was seasoned, and someone who was generally well-liked, that probably is Biden. Would he have some negatives, having been associated with this administration? Sure. But um, I think you're right, yes. I think the chance of her being indicted is relatively small. Uh, again, Donald Trump is leading the Republican race, so anything can happen. But I, would, I wouldn't expect that. Yes, there's a question here. I don't know if there's a microphone. Just holler and I'll repeat it. I'll, I'll repeat it. So if uh, Trump doesn't get it, let's just say. If Trump doesn't get it. If Cruz doesn't get it. This is simultaneous translation in <laughs> politics. If Cruz doesn't get it. So Casey gets it. Okay, if, Kasich, if, if, if the Republicans somehow come to their senses in the next few months, or if just as a deadlock, Cruz can't, I mean, uh, Trump can't get to 1,237, Cruz tries, he can't get to 1,237, and there is a true open, open convention. Now remember, I did not use the word brokered. You'll hear that. A brokered convention would require brokers. And there are very few brokers, there are no brokers these days. The democratization in politics has emasculated a lot of previously powerful folks who now, you know, the speaker looks around, and it's, he has to see whether his membership is behind him. In the old days, if the speaker said jump, they, the member said how high. Uh, so an open convention uh, picked uh, John Kasich. So John Kasich would start off as the narrow favorite over Hillary. He would start off as a favorite because his, uh, he's leading her in the polls now, and that's what the first people would look at. Second of all, they would see him as a more pragmatic, a moderate conservative who talks about not allowing people to be left behind. He's always talking about the poor, the addicted, the you know, homeless. And that would soften the edges of a Republican Party that has gotten a little hard-edged. Like Ted Cruz, his edges are very hard. So uh, then the question is, what happens during the campaign? And folks, the primary reason why John Kasich is doing so well in ballot tests against, hypothetical ballot tests against Hillary Clinton is that nobody knows anything about him. So his, if I read you John Kasich's unfavorable, it's microscopically low, because he hasn't been attacked. And, and in a funny way, that's how he stayed in the race, is his, his negatives are low and nobody says anything bad about him because he's irrelevant. That, that, this is a stunning strategy. I will be so irrelevant that nobody dislikes me and I'll just stay in the race. So then the question is, when they unloaded on him, would he have a, how, how would the race be? Now, he just won overwhelmingly as re-elected governor of Ohio, over 60% of the vote. But it didn't hurt that the Democratic nominee was caught in a dark, car with a woman parked in a dark parking lot at like four o'clock in the morning. The woman was not his wife and he couldn't explain why she was there with him. It probably didn't hurt uh, Kasich's bid. So the Democrats would beat up on him, would attack his more conservative positions. I think the race would close and be a very competitive race. But Hillary is weak and a Republican who isn't as weak as she is suddenly becomes a very formidable opponent. Okay, all right, uh, one last one. Can you explain what would happen with Rubio's delegates? Can, can I explain what would happen with Rubio's delegates? So, yes. so the way delegates, delegates are uh, 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 completely chosen by and rules set by the states. And my understanding is as long as Rubio says he is a delegate, uh, states can say, no, you're still bound by him. Now, there are some states which can look and say, but he's not an active candidate, so you're no longer committed. And these, the, the, whether, whether delegates are bound for one round or unbound or bound for three rounds, that all has to do with the states, the state party and the state law. So I believe that most of Rubio's delegates would stay loyal to Rubio, but some states might allow Rubio delegates to become unpledged, and they would be then be targets of Cruz and Trump and the like. Now, uh, I don't know whether a lot of little Marcos delegates would be particularly attracted to Donald Trump. Uh, and, and when Marco got out of the race, uh, Marco was very specific about encouraging his delegates to support uh, Cruz as a better way to stop Donald Trump. 
And Marco, as you know, won Puerto Rico, he won Minnesota, he won DC, and he won a handful of delegates here or there. So he's in the 170s. Uh, I thought you were going to ask whether he might be under consideration as VP. Trump has said he might be. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, two parts to any equation, and the question is whether Rubio and Kasich would be willing to run with, with uh, Trump and be part of a Trump administration. That's an interesting question as well. Thanks very much.